I'm very honored today to introduce Dr. Kelvin Drogemeyer. Dr. Drogemeyer is director of the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy, serving as President Trump's science advisor and leading OSTP in its coordination of science and technology initiatives across the federal government. Before joining the White House, Dr. Drogemeyer served as Vice President for Research and Regents Professor of Meteorology at the University of Oklahoma, where he joined the faculty in 1985 as Assistant Professor of Meteorology. Dr. Drogemeyer has served two six-year terms at the National Science Board, the governing body of the NSF, including the last four years as Vice Chairman, having been nominated by Presidents George W. Bush and Barack Obama, and twice confirmed by the United States Senate. He's also served on and chaired numerous national boards and committees, and he's a fellow of the American Meteorological Society and the American Association for the Advancement of Science. He was appointed in 2017 as Oklahoma Cabinet Secretary of Science and Technology. Born in Kansas, Dr. Drogemeyer earned a BS in meteorology from the University of Oklahoma and MS and PhD degrees in atmospheric science from the University of Illinois in Urbana-Champaign. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Drogemeyer to start off our 2019 forum with his presentation, A Bold New Era of American Science and Technology. Thank you so much, Maureen. Good morning, everyone. It's great to see you all here. Uh, you know, I sat out where you're sitting uh, many, many times, actually, and have learned a great deal from this incredible uh, event. And I never, ever dreamed that I would be up here speaking before you. And so it's a great honor and a privilege to, to do that. I love the topics that this forum is engaging. It's, it's always extraordinary. But I think at this point in time, the things that you just saw that Maureen presented are really, really important for our nation. So I really want to thank you for taking time to come and participate in this, not just to, to be sort of passive listeners, but to be active participants, especially in these, uh, in these sessions where you're going to be uh, you know, having the breakouts and talking about lots of interesting things. You know, this, this whole notion about a second bold era, you know, what do I mean by that? Well, I, I've done some sort of historical analysis when I testified before Congress uh, a couple of years ago about a particular topic, and, and uh, I, I started to really reflect on where we're at today and how we got here. And I won't go into the details, but I think you all know uh, Vannevar Bush, who wrote uh, Science the Endless Frontier. And if you haven't read that document, I really encourage you to do so. And I'll show a picture of him in just a moment. Uh, Post-World War II, when President Roosevelt asked him, how do we translate the, the tremendous uh, benefits that, that really help win the war, how do we translate that into the future going forward out of the military context into a more civilian, empowering context of the nation? Vannevar wrote this incredible, very brief, but very powerful treatise had three elements to it. It said, number one, we need to have government supported basic research. Number two, we need to sort of think about continuing to educate the next generation. And the third thing is we need to sort of unlock the, the data and unlock the information that was at that time classified to the extent possible. So you kind of think, well, okay, what is that? That's, it's research, it's, it's uh, STEM education, and it's, uh, it's open access, essentially, you know, making things available and, and openly available. And so that really set the stage, and, and he called that the endless frontier, which I love. But the point here is that the, the era that we have been in for the past 60, 70 years post-World War II was one in which we had the federal government, you know, doing what it always needs to be doing, funding basic research and investing in high-risk high reward activities, something that absolutely has to continue. We need robust federal budgets in, in science. But at that time, the private sector had a very different role. Nonprofits were, you know, phil philanthropic uh, uh, concerns were actually funding universities, but they aren't uh, what they, they weren't back then what they are today. And then, uh, of course, the universities were funded largely by states and by philanthropy. You fast forward to today, it's a whole different enterprise, though it still has the same elements. You know, we have trillion dollar companies out there that are launching satellites. Uh, we've got them fielding major computing facilities. They're, they fund about and do about two-thirds to three-quarters of all the research in, in the country. And Matt Hurahan has these wonderful slides that show this. So there's been this progression of empowerment of the private sector and also the nonprofits. And my point in talking about the second bold era is to say that we've kind of think about turning the page here to think of the enterprise somewhat differently as a connected set of elements that are all extraordinarily powerful, but oftentimes we don't think of them in a connected way. If you think about Sputnik in 1957, the only entity that could have responded to that and did respond was the federal government. 
Today, it could be Virgin Galactic, it could be SpaceX. It doesn't necessarily have to be the federal government, though I want to stress the federal government has a very important continuing role in funding you know, basic research and, and charting the course for the nation. That's extremely important. But when you, when you step back and look at the box top of the puzzle, as I like to say, you see the whole picture. So when we tend to focus on one particular element or another, I think we're missing that big picture in the second era where we say, you know, let's, let's put all of this stuff together and let's work more effectively across these traditionally distinct but very important collaborative boundaries to where we leverage each other's assets in, in a very, very important, powerful way. And coming from academia, I've been 33 years as a professor in the university, I can tell you that the, the types of interactions that I've seen, and I founded a private company as well about 20 years ago, it's still going, believe it or not, because I didn't have anything to do with it, so that's why it survived. Um, you know, I, these interactions aren't what they could be. Now, there's some wonderful, wonderful examples, but as a nation, I don't think we do so well in that area, and that's something I really want to want to work on. So I'll come back to that in a moment. But that's what I mean by the second bold era. The first bold era was a post-World War II, Vannevar Bush, wonderful era of growth and development. But I, I think if we sort of step back and say, wow, look at what we have today. Look at the extraordinary capabilities we have. But then also realize one very important thing that does relate back to the, to the victory, the Allied victory in World War II, and that is our values. We don't talk enough about this, I think, to our postdocs, to our graduate students, to folks coming into the enterprise to say, we have all this great stuff, and yes, we have challenges, but the American values that underpin what we do very much reflect the values that we have as scientists, right? Open inquiry, unfettered debate, unleashing the human curiosity, the human spirit to go out and discover. That freedom is extraordinary and very, very powerful here in the United States. And sometimes when you live in the middle of that, every day, you sort of forget about it. So I would just say, let's, let's make sure that we, don't, uh, that we don't forget about that as we go along. So I have given uh, talks on science policy, actually, learning a lot from this very group. And, and so I, I went back to a few of those slides and I said, well, maybe I ought to be a little bit of a professor today and say, let's talk a little bit about policy. We use that word sort of loosely, but what is it? You know, I, I asked myself this question about 20 years ago. I said, I know what law is, I know other things, but what is policy? And there are a lot of ways to define it, but I think one of the most beautiful definitions that resonates with the job I have now is that it basically projects an intent to, uh, to do something. That is then that, that intent is then carried out by a series of actions. And a great example of that is John Kennedy's speech uh, during the Cuban Missile Crisis, where he said from the Oval Office, it shall be the policy of this nation to regard any missile launched from Cuba, that's how he said it, launched from Cuba against any nation in the Western Hemisphere is an attack by the Soviet Union upon the United States requiring a full retaliatory response upon the Soviet Union. That was the policy of the federal government that he espoused. Now, he didn't say anything about how that was going to happen, but he said that's the policy. So he didn't put the action with the policy. The action follows the policy. And so that's, in the world I live in, that's, that's really one of the focal points of, um, of what policy is. Now, it's equally interesting to look at what policy is not. Policy is not law, okay? But certain policies, for example, I'll talk about this in a second, presidential executive orders have the effect of law in the federal government, in federal agencies. Now, Rush Holt, who was a, a tremendous congressman for, for many, many years, chaired the House Science Committee, you know, uh, laws, in fact, establish policy. They, they are policy by virtue of the fact that they're law, but policy itself is not law. So you kind of have to think in those terms. Policy also, if you think about policy analysis, there are a lot of policy analysts in Washington and elsewhere, that increases the scope of options available to policymakers. When you analyze things, it's like, okay, we have these options. Okay, that's what policy analysis does. Policy advocacy really narrows those down. So, and I'm gonna talk about advocacy here in a second, but, but analysis increases the range of options. Uh, policy advocacy, whoops, geez, I should be clicking this thing, shouldn't I? There we go, what policy is not. Uh, advocacy sort of narrows down the, uh, the range of options. Jack Marburger, who uh, was President uh, George W. Bush's science advisor, a man that I, I dearly loved, and we unfortunately lost him uh, several years ago, a brilliant man, he said, uh, you know, people who advocate, they're advocates for certain things, they do so with passion, but it's sort of a narrow interest, and it's very appropriate that they do that. But as a science advisor, the job is to, to uh, provide advice or guidance or assessment of that, of that advocacy. So advocacy and assessment and advocacy and advice are very, very different things. With advice, you have to look at the box top of the puzzle. With advocacy, you take one piece and you just say, you know, this is so important and you, you speak to why it's important and that's, uh, that's entirely appropriate. Now, who advises on policy? Well, there's a lot of, lot of folks. Formally, OSTP, Office of Science Technology Policy. Um, 
PCAS, the President's Council of Advisors on Science and Technology, again, formally advised the President. Various components in the White House, we call them components, Office of Management and Budget, Council on Environmental Quality, Council of Economic Advisors, National Security Council, they all advise the President on a variety of policy matters. National Science Board does that. Um, we do that through hearings, congressional hearings. Those are all the formal mechanisms by which the government receives advice, not just in the executive branch, but advice as a federal government. Now, informally, there are many, many organizations, including AAAS, including the National Academies, lobbyists, individuals, um, people like staff. Uh, I found that staff are very powerful who say, you know, close the door and turn the lights off before you leave. That's a policy in our office that if you don't follow, you're in serious trouble. So policy isn't just the kind of thing you think it is. There are a lot of people who make policy. But seriously, the informal policy um, advice is extremely important. At the federal level, if you look at who actually then creates policy, well, the president obviously creates policy at the executive level. The cabinet does, agency officials do, uh, and also, as I say, staff can create policy by telling you to unplug the coffee pot or whatever. Um, policy is enforced, so you think about, okay, well, who enforces policy? This is a question I ask myself, okay, so you've got policy out there. Who says if you, if you don't adhere to policy, you're in serious trouble? Well, inspectors general do that, but also regulatory uh, organizations, agencies, like EPA, for example, is a policy creation and a policy enforcement organization. So uh, Maureen talked about evidence-based policy. I think that's an extremely important point. And science is certainly, and my role is to make sure that science is at the table when policy is discussed. Uh, it informs policy. There are a number of other things in her balloon diagram, which is a wonderful diagram that, that say, you know, policy is informed by lots and lots of things. The economy, particular points of view, say by the president or Congress, so on and so forth, and also by, by the, the economy, by, you know, national security concerns. So some folks think that if science says this, policy should be that, and it, it's not so directly connected, and her diagram shows that. So this is why policy, why science rather, needs to be at the table and it needs to be in the conversation and then explained in the appropriate ways so that it's part of that mix. And that's, that's one of the beauties of this policy forum, to, to sort of learn how to do that and also understand the thoughts and the minds of other people who are actually in the room thinking about policy from a different perspective, not just from the, uh, the science perspective. Now, policy mechanisms, I mentioned a few of these, uh, executive orders by the president. Uh, the one on the upper right is an executive order on, uh, what is that, I think I put in, uh, Historically Black Colleges and Universities, signed in 2017. We're doing some really exciting things there. The one on the upper left is uh, one from DOE on uh, national security concerns and policy. And then you see President Trump there and an executive order being signed. There's also presidential memoranda, national security presidential memoranda, lots of different things like that, agency memoranda like the one from DOE. And at NSF, for example, they issue important notices. And one came out last summer on sexual harassment. So there are a lot of different ways that agencies convey policy and develop policy, uh, for example, in the case of NSF by the National Science Board. Policy engagement, how, how do you engage with it? That picture in the lower, uh, uh, the lower picture there is AAAS Policy uh, Fellows, incredible program. Uh, there's Stippy Fellows, there's in the upper right is the White House uh, Fellows Program. We have benefited enormously at OSTP from the AAAS Fellows, and also when I was on the National Science Board, we have AAAS Fellows in the, uh, in the National Science Board office. And there are all kinds of other fellowships that folks can get involved with. And a lot of times people think, well, I'm too old for that. No, some of the White House fellows are, are mid, mid part of their career. And in fact, the wisdom that you have coming into a fellows program, and I know a lot of these you know, welcome, say, faculty and others coming in, say, from private industry, it's, it's a rich opportunity to, to participate in the policy process and to learn about policy so you can engage in it uh, most effectively. So that's really an exciting sort of thing. Um, I want to talk just briefly about what OSTP is. Um, Historically, it arose really out of, as I say, Vannevar Bush, who's pictured there on the left, who was uh, Roosevelt's, President Roosevelt's sort of de facto science advisor. He ran the Office of Scientific Research and Development and developed the treaties. And there's a, there's a history I won't go into, but you, the picture there where you see President Nixon signing uh, a bill, uh, OSCP was formally created uh, in 1976. And it turned out President Nixon actually fired his science advisor. And so Congress created OSTP by legislation uh, in, uh, in 1976. And its role, basically, there are multiple roles, but its principal role is to serve as, a, as an advisor to the president and to all executive branch agencies 
uh, or components on uh, all, all matters of science and technology. It also coordinates interagency activities, as I'll show you in just a minute, and uh, it identifies uh, challenges, deals with things like uh, uh, emerging uh, threats, like, for example, the, the Ebola outbreak, uh, John Holdren's OSTP, uh, my predecessor was very heavily involved in that, natural disasters and things like that. So it basically is the go-to place in the White House for, for science advice and science policy. Um, the mission of OSTP has been sort of conveyed differently by different directors, and here's how I like to talk about it. I like to say that the, the fundamental mission of OSTP is to ensure that the American S&T enterprise leads the world, pure and simple. Now, that doesn't mean that we are the, the top in every discipline, however one might measure that. It just truly means that we lead the world. And there are three ways that I think we go about doing that. The first is unleashing uh, uh, discovery and innovation. As a professor and as a vice president for research, former VPR, my role was to help faculty be successful in creating, and my graduate students and postdocs, you know, removing roadblocks, making sure that they could take their intellectual talent, their curiosity, their creative capability, and just, just run with it, just, just blast ahead and do some really uh, extraordinary things. So that's really, uh, to me, the foremost, uh, uh, the foremost function of OSTP is to ensure that that happens. And there are lots of different ways that we go about that. Um, one of the ways is to, uh, the things I'm working on, is to do a, a full-on sort of uh, national assessment of our S&T enterprise. We've never really done that. Look at a competitive position. What are the gaps? Where are we at today in certain areas where we wish that we were ahead of the game? And what, what decisions did we make five or ten years ago that sort of were maybe the wrong decisions or we didn't make the right decisions to get to where we thought we wanted to be? What, is, what does that look like? That's a very, very challenging thing to do. But to me, as a weather guy, as a meteorological modeler, that's the initial condition of the forecast. Then I want us to take that, I want to project it forward 10, 20, 30 years beyond decadal surveys to really look hard and think hard about where we're going as a nation in S&T. You might think, well, 30 years, you know, a meteorologist, really, you're asking me to look 30, you guys can't forecast the weather, you know, a week in advance. You're right. I especially can't do that. Other people are much better. But, but I, think, I think it's important that we play the long game. We need to start thinking long. And I'm not talking about changing the budgeting process, but I am talking about really thinking about where we're going in a holistic way. Uh, another key thing there in, in terms of unleashing discovery and innovation is partnerships. And I mentioned that before, that we really need to partner across the spectrum of our four components, industry, government, academia, and nonprofits, in much more effective ways. And there are things that sort of impede that, uh, that partnering right now, intellectual property issues and things like that, so misperceptions that we have. We talked about this endlessly, but the National Institute of Standards and Technology released last uh, Friday, a week ago uh, tomorrow, a so-called green paper that they've worked on. And there's, to my mind, the first opportunity I've seen in my whole career where we can really address some of these key issues that tend to stand in our way. And also, one of the things that I'm, I'm extremely keen on, and uh, you may have read about this uh, in, a, in an article, I think, that came out uh, today or yesterday, about research administrative burdens. Um, I don't know how many of you know about this, but um, uh, you know, there are a lot of um, research compliance uh, requirements, some of which are extraordinarily important, like human subject research, animal research, laboratory safety, radiation safety, things like that. A lot of other things that are uh, out there that really are unnecessarily hampering the ability of our scientists and our engineers and scholars to do research. And uh, this has been known for, for many, many years. There have been multiple surveys. There have been National Academy reports. There's even been stuff put in legislation. And we still aren't seeing a whole lot of progress. So I can tell you, I'm coming into OSTP to change that, to make a difference. I didn't come here, as the article said, to keep the lights on. I came in to make a difference. And we have an absolute plan to do this. We know what we're going to tackle. We have a complete plan laid out for the next 16, 18 months of the first term. And we're going to go do it. Now, in fact, I'm hiring somebody in OSTP very soon. Uh, in fact, we're in the process of doing all the paperwork, the administration, to bring on a person I'm calling the Assistant Director for Academic Engagement. I want this person to wake up every day and worry about making sure that a lot of these challenges that we face, and I'll talk about a couple more here, especially in the academic enterprise, but not solely in the academic enterprise, are addressed and dealt with. So what? So that we can unleash discovery and innovation, we can create partnerships, and we can have this, this American R&D engine running on all cylinders. And that's very, very important to me. So I'm happy to answer questions about that later if you have them, but uh, you're going to be hearing more about that. And we have a structure in place that we're going to be executing. The building of the workforce of the future is exactly what you think it is. But I like to call it seamless STEM education, where we're really thinking about STEM education across a continuum from the skilled technical workforce, and, and really starting with uh, pre-K, early childhood, which my own university did a lot of work in that. And I really learned about how important it is for children pre-K to, to be exposed to certain kinds of things and the environments in which they live, 
have a massive influence on, on their productivity and on their uh, intellectual capabilities later on. So pre-K all the way through lifelong learning, but in a seamless way, in an integrative way, where we have research universities and two-year colleges and vocational technical schools and, and, and boot camps and things like that working all across the spectrum together, you know, doing not only what they were created to do, but also helping each other out to do things that the one can do better perhaps than the other. So that's a very important thing. We actually issued a, um, a STEM education report last, uh, I think it was November, for the nation that has three fundamental pillars, a STEM literate society, STEM workforce of the future, and broadening participation. And the broadening participation piece is another element of this academic engagement piece that we've talked about forever. Uh, we're making some progress, but in many ways, in certain quarters, we're actually going backwards. We've got to, got to, got to get this right. We've got to work on this. The, the demographics of our nation are very, very uh, telling in terms of where we're going, but to me, it, it's more than that. It's unlocking the capability that's resonant in every person of America, regardless of where they live, regardless of their zip code, regardless of their background. I'm from an EPSCOR state, Oklahoma, and I can tell you that there are a lot of really wonderful people, smart people, who have a lot to contribute but just don't have the opportunity. And I had the great fortune of uh, talking to a, an NIH uh, senior leader the other day, and he said, you know, when I bring people into my lab, he's a senior administrator, but he still runs his lab, as most folks in NIH do. It's wonderful. He said, I only hire people from states that don't have, or for, sorry, from institutions that are not research intensive. So he said, I hire them from Idaho, from, from Wyoming, from, you know, Arkansas, whatever. Not to say that those don't have wonderful institutions, but his point was, I've got some of these people that come in, they didn't think they had the potential, and now they're, they're at Harvard. They're at Johns Hopkins, they're at HHMI, they're doing all these incredible things. I love that story because there's so much resident capability out there that, that goes untapped. And then the final point here is the advancing American values. What does that mean? Well, as scholars, we know first and foremost that we want research to be conducted with the highest standards of ethical behavior, the highest standards of, of capability, openness, transparency, and collaboration. That's what our American values really speak to. We had a Sackler colloquium in this very room a couple of years ago I was fortunate to be a part of, and I learned about reproducibility more than I ever, uh, you know, more, a whole lot more than I knew at the time. And uh, I think a lot of folks tend to conflate uh, you know, research ethics and stuff with irreproducibility, and that's, they're very distinct and different. So that's something that we need to bring some, uh, some clarity to. So we also have to think about protecting American research assets. Uh, we have a very wonderful open research enterprise, and we, we have to recognize that, that that enterprise is sort of under threat right now, but we can't forsake that enterprise, that openness. It's what made us who we are today, and it's part of our value system. But on the other hand, we also have to be vigilant to protect our assets. And so that's another very important conversation uh, about, um, about this, uh, this issue of American values that we're, we're focusing on, research integrity, reproducibility, protecting our assets. We're doing a lot of bilateral S&T agreements whoops, uh, with, uh, with various countries. We're talking, I've met with many, many foreign science ministers. And another very important point for me is uh, safe and accommodating research environments, uh, AKA things like sexual harassment. Absolutely unacceptable, intolerable, and we've got to change that, and we will. So this person who I'm hiring that's coming in as the Assistant Director for Academic Engagement is going to have this portfolio, but you will be hearing very soon about another structure in which this stuff is going to actually be, be run and coordinated and organized across agencies, but also throughout the community, engaging the entire community, industry, academia, government, and nonprofits. We've got to have everybody at the table if, we're, if we hope to address, uh, address these issues. So um, I wanted to throw in the oblig obligatory slide here about uh, how OSDP is, is organized. We have, for those of you who don't know it, we actually have uh, three divisions, uh, science, technology, and uh, national security. We have about 70 folks in the organization, many of whom are PhD policy advisors, policy analysts. We get a lot of those folks as detailees from federal agencies. Our sister agencies are wonderful in providing folks to us. We bring some from academia. Uh, we're very creative in how we do that sometimes, but the agencies help us out enormously. Uh, then we have in pink, there are two councils. These other things are sort of people, but these are, these are councils. The NSTC that I'll talk about in a moment, and PCAS, the President's Council of Advisors in Science Technology. As you see at the bottom there, you know, the policy streams, as we call them, run the gamut. And, and you know, when I was preparing for my hearing, I, I came in, and there were like 90 different projects from desalination and the nuclear materials launch and, and ocean policy and, uh, oh my goodness, uh, space weather and artificial intelligence that I had to sort of get my hands around. So we, we wrote up little policy briefs on these so that other folks that came in, come and go through OSTP could very quickly come up to speed. And it's an extraordinary portfolio with extraordinary people doing the work. 
And one of the things that we do uh, is work with the interagencies and all of you, and I, I really want to underscore this point, as could Maureen made it, in terms of, you know, we are a listener and we're a convener. I've had lots of university presidents come to talk to me. I've been to the National Academy, as I just met yesterday with the Atlantic Council. You know, I don't have all the answers, folks. And when I was VPR, I would tell the faculty, I, as the administrator, I don't have all the answers, but I know smart people who do, and they're called faculty. I take that now to the level of the federal government and say, I don't have all the answers, but you all do, all of you, or as we say in Oklahoma, all y'all. That's plural for y'all. All y'all have the answers. So, you know, we want and we will be more so, you know, reaching out to you on all these kinds of things. But how do we determine the priorities? As Maureen said, it's a very interesting thing. You know, for me, it's we listen, right? It's not a top-down sort of a thing. We listen to the community and say, what, what do we need to be doing to what? To make this nation lead the world in S&T. And so the priorities memo that OMB and OSTP issues every year, roughly June or July, is one way that we articulate those. So this is an important time for me to be listening as we talk to OMB about what the priorities are uh, for the nation, and I want to certainly be hearing from you. I want to spend just a second talking about the NSTC. I know we need, need some time for questions here. This is a very important council. If you haven't heard about it, uh, it's, it's an executive level council. Actually, it's chaired by the president, and he delegates that authority to the OSTP director. And basically what it does, it, it coordinates all the interagency activities on science and technology. So we actually have the agency heads that are part of the uh, NSTC and uh, coordinates federal R&D. So we have actually six committees uh, that are chaired by agency heads. We have an executive director who's fabulous. Um, and we meet regularly, and these committees literally meet like you know, every week practically. So there's, so, there's like 50, 60 different work streams that are going on. But this is a place where it happens. And, and, and not only the interagency, but bringing in folks from the outside. So for example, the STEM education plan that was uh, issued late last year started by convening about 160 people from all over the country, all states. My state sent three, uh, three people. So it was this, this broad conversation, the first time it had ever been done. And so the state, excuse me, the strategic STEM plan reflects that input of everyone. And when, you, when people look at that, a, a superintendent, a, a, a teacher, a student, a parent can say, I see myself in there. I see how this is relevant to me. So not only does NSCC convene you know, across the agencies, it also convenes across the community. And so I want to mention very, very briefly, and then I have some time for questions, some science uh, policy accomplishments here in science. I won't go through these in great detail, but I just want you to kind of look at this. Uh, uh, opioids, a very, very important issue. Uh, desalination, very important for creating fresh water, and in case, some cases with renewable energy. Ocean decadal vision, we're part of the Ocean Council. I'm part of that. I co-chair that. Quantum Summit, Quantum Strategic Overview. A lot of folks will say, you know, well, we don't know where the nation is going in AI or quantum. Y yes, yes we do. It's right here in these reports. So I would encourage you to visit the NSTC website and to look at this stuff, because this is really where the agencies convene with other stakeholders really make those, um, those decisions. Um, national security, things like near-Earth objects, uh, critical minerals, very, very important. We released a National Space Weather Strategy and Action Plan recently, and things like countering UAS, very, very important, space weather benchmarks. So a lot of things going on in the national security arena. Uh, also in technology, uh, Michael Kratzios, who was running OSTP until I got there, extraordinary, extraordinary individual. And, and the tech agenda is just completely robust. And, Super uh, large numbers of things that are going on here. Uh, select Committee on AI. We have a national strategy for advanced manufacturing. We have a quantum bill that was passed by, uh, by Congress and signed into law by the president that lays out uh, a quantum uh, national coordination office for quantum, which we're in the process of standing up. So we're really moving forward. Now, some people say, well, you're not moving forward fast enough. You know, China is moving quickly. Well, we're, we're, we're moving fast, and, uh, and we understand those competitive issues, but we are moving very, very fast. Uh, we'd issue a science technology highlights document uh, the second year we did this and just highlight the black hole. Uh, for those who feel that, that nothing is happening in S&T in this administration, that's absolutely not true. Come visit OSTP, look at this document, look at the agencies. You'll see there are very, very significant achievements and policy actions that are actually happening as well. Sometimes they don't get messaged uh, as much as they should, and so we're working on that to make sure that the science community certainly, uh, and the, you know, everybody, every citizen knows about this. And finally, let me just give you some unsolicited advice. I assume that some of the folks that are here are coming to learn about policy. So I'd say learn about it informally, immerse yourself. You know, go visit people like, come to, come to OSTP. We're happy to talk to you about that. Uh, take a course, you know, if, if you're, 50 years old, in the middle of your career, and you're like, uh, I'd like to learn more. You can go to a university and sign up for a course. There are wonderful things, uh, options that you have available now uh, to even get 
uh, you know, get a credential in policy without much work uh, in the sense of it's not a heavy lift to start the process. You know, it's got to do the work to get the credential, but, but it's easy to do in terms of making it happen. Uh, become involved. There are many opportunities. I mentioned the AAAS. You obviously saw the, the, the fellows, and Marie mentioned those, but we have White House fel uh, fellows, Presidential Innovation fellows. Every branch of government has fellows, so really look into those wonderful, immersive opportunities. And also serving in your congressional office. Uh, I floated an idea one time that every university ought to, not every university, every, every state ought to seek out from their universities an individual to serve in their, their members of Congress office, as the Senate and the, the, um, the actual uh, House offices, for a year. And that the university would pay for it, it'd be a sabbatical, and they would be there just as a resident sort of you know, scholar to address any kind of question that comes up and say, okay, I know somebody at my university or somebody in some other university in my state who could, who could help you write that bill, who's an expert in that area. It would build really wonderful relationships, totally nonpartisan, um, but also those folks would go back to their institution having learned quite a bit about the process, and over four or five years you now have, you know, what, 2,500, 250 people, or 2,500 people who've done that or, or more, and that would really be a game changer, I think, for folks understanding how, how things work on the Hill. Work with and advise the government. There's lots and lots of ways that you can do that. I mentioned those, so the informal ways. And also consider policy as a career. Um, when I was, you know, just on the science board and stuff, the idea was back then, well, if you can't if you go through and get a degree from a university and you can't get a faculty job, I guess you could go do policy. There's nothing else in here. Now, policy is a really wonderfully respected activity that folks come and do right out of their PhD or right out of their postdoc. I think that's fabulous. We absolutely need folks like that. But it's never too late. The presidential fellows that I met with, some of them, they're mid-career, a lot of military folks in there who are in their mid-40s, you know, and still active in the military, but they're presidential fellows. And they took a whole year, uh, I think it was a year, Elena, correct me if I'm wrong, it was at least half a year, if not a whole year, to do that. I think that's wonderful. And the military is so supportive. So anyway, I, I would encourage you to do that. So please follow us, if you would, on uh, Twitter. Our handle is WHOSTP, White House OSTP. We tweet a lot. Um, that maybe isn't surprising to you. I've sort of learned that tweeting is important. Uh, so I, I actually pay attention to Twitter these days. And uh, it's been such a pleasure to talk with you. And uh, let this be the start of the conversation. Please come see us. I love, I, I'm a down in the trenches kind of person. I'm not somebody who's, you know, who can't be reached. I have an email address. You can contact me. I love meeting with you. I love hearing your ideas because it's only through your ideas put together with everyone else's ideas that we can really solve some of these challenges. So thank you so much for the opportunity to be here. I know I've got a Japanese delegation that I've got to open here at, uh, yes. at 9.30, so, uh, and I've gone on a little long. Thank you so much. Ask your question? If you have questions, please use the microphones. Yeah. Okay. okay, I'm Gil Oman. We're, Hi, Gil. Yeah. I'm so appreciative that you've uh, given us this keynote today. And I particularly like the way you started with your personal connection to AAAS and to the mission that you outlined so fully. I want to highlight one issue mm -hmm. in the area of uh, protecting American assets. All over the country, people are confused right now about the instructions to identify foreign components, people, trainees, even data, specimens, contacts, co-authorships. And when we are briefed by NIH, NSF, and other agency people, they sort of throw up their hands and say, we're waiting for clarification. Can you help us? Gil, thank you for that, and, and let me just say that, um, that OSTP is, is now working on that issue very, very hard, uh, and I would say that we have not been, had an active involvement there because there wasn't a director. That's the only reason, and they were waiting until the director got confirmed, and because I was nominated last August, uh, yeah. so I can assure you that we are going to be playing a role in that, uh, and, and it's, to me, it's one of the most important things. Every president I've met with, and in fact, uh, the meeting I had just yesterday, it's the top line concern. And you're right, there is, there's a lot of good stuff going on. I think on May 10th, the National Academies you know, has an activity. So there's a lot of good things happening. But I think we need sort of this, we need to do the conversation not only like that, but like that. And that's, that's what OSCP can really do is convene, bring folks together, and really understand the issues. But then we have to have solutions. We know the challenges, but we've really got to find solutions that are true to the values that we have that don't draw, you know, huge tall fences around massively big areas. 
um, that preserve our enterprise, but also take into account the values. And I, I think the other thing is faculty and research have, have, have really awoken to the challenge. Uh, I think in the last year in particular, I think people have realized, yeah, this is real, but let's be thoughtful in how we actually go, go about addressing it. So uh, uh, yeah, I couldn't agree more, Gil, and we're going to, you're right. going to hear much more about that very soon. Great. Yes, thanks, thanks for that. Uh, Jeff Murray. Hi, Jeff. Hi, with science. You said your job as science advisor is to ensure that the U.S. research enterprise continues to lead the world. You mentioned it today. Right. Your boss has proposed double-digit budget cuts to several major research agencies, including NIH, NSF, and DOE Science. <clears throat> Why is cutting federal support for basic research a good way to preserve U.S. preeminence? I think the thing, Jeff, it goes back to the point I made about the, uh, the enterprise. Uh, the President's very mindful of the budget caps. He's also very mindful of the debt that we have, and he has priorities. And the, the priorities that were articulated in the R&D part of the budget were, number one, the industries of the future, for which there are you know, investments in things like AI and quantum information science and advanced manufacturing, that kind of thing. And then also um, securing American, uh, you know, uh, secure, American security. Um, so that, that's the priority. Now, I, again, I'm saying that you know, we, we absolutely have to have robust federal budgets, but on the other hand, if we only focus on that, we're missing the big picture of when you leverage the federal investments of over $130 billion against everything else, we have a really spectacularly powerful enterprise. So you know, we have challenges for sure, but I think one of the most important ways we can address those is to think across the enterprise, leverage our dollars, work together and that's how we can, we can really maintain our, our leadership. Grant Allard, Clemson University. Hi, Grant. Um, um, thank you for being here, Director Drogmeyer. Sure. Um, I, I appreciate hearing what you have to say. One of the challenges that Henry Lambright outlines with um, science advising and science in government is that the political cycle is a two, four, and six year cycle, right. and the science cycle is 10, 20, and 30 years. How do you propose, because it sounds like you have um, new positions coming in, how do you, how does OSTP deal with that political cycle and how do you personally deal with it? Yeah, no, that's, a, that's a great question. The same thing is true for working with industry. You know, universities operate on like a two-year cycle for masters and whatever, and the industry says, I just, I want to fund you for six months. And oh gosh, there's a big disconnect. No, there are ways to deal with that. So I'll go back, that's a very good question. Um, what I want to do is this, this assessment. We're, we're actually in the process of setting that up now, this sort of, okay, the snapshot of where we're at today, what's our competitive position, what are the gaps, and so on, and then doing a look ahead 10 to 20 years. And that's not something that you can do overnight, so it's a process that I would like to put into place that will be sustainable beyond the next budget cycle, the two years, the four years, but it's something that we would refresh, say, like every, you know, five to seven years to go back and say, okay, where are we and where are we going? Um, we haven't done that, and I think, you know, we certainly have, and let me say, in things like decadal surveys, we do it in pockets, but as a government, as a, as a nation, we haven't done that. So that's, that's really what I want to do, and that's how I tackle that problem, because that, it's exactly the thing you mentioned, that's what motivated me to even start thinking about this, is that, you know, this thing has to transcend the standard slower cadences, or short, sorry, the shorter term cadences, and take the much longer halt. And that can be informed by those, but it can't be whipsawed back and forth by every election cycle or whatever. It's got to be sustained as a much longer stable sort of look, which will hopefully inform in a more stable way the, the budgeting and prioritization processes. Does that, does that answer your question? Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Good. Thank you. I think uh, we need to be yeah. wheels up. One more? Okay. Uh, uh, hey, David Press Secretary Kramer. says one more. David Kramer with Physics Today. Hi, David. Um, your uh, staff prior to you coming to office was reviewing the Obama era uh, policy on open access to the scientific uh, literature. Uh -huh. um, have you decided to leave that uh, policy now untouched, unchanged? The, it's still a work in progress. Um, so there's been no, no formal movement on that, no, no formal you know, action taken. But I, I will say that the one thing I believe this government will never do, and that is to tell faculty or re any, I always say faculty, I mean researchers, scholars, what journals they have to publish in or what types of journals they have to publish in. That's totally uh, counter to our values and totally counter to the scholarly enterprise, and so that I don't see that happening. Yeah. Okay. Good. Thank you all. Appreciate it. Enjoy the rest of your day.